Good evening, this is John Milburn for Laws 12063. This is Advanced Statutory Interpretation and Drafting. We have two participants, Grace and Nicole. Thank you both for joining us this evening. I want to start by referring you to a very important website generally, but specifically in relation to this unit, and it is the Australian Law Reform Commission. So let's um, have a look at the website for the ALRC. You should see that on your screen. Now, what's particularly important and relevant about this website is that it provides you with valuable information around common law statutory interpretation principles, but does so within the context of numerous inquiries. And you'll see there a current inquiry is litigation funding inquiry. But there are a wide range of inquiries that the ALRC will consider. Uh, some relate to things like elder abuse, very much in the news now, class actions, lawyers litigation funding, as we just saw, reforms to the family law system, and other things such as religious exemptions in anti-discrimination, all very topical. And given that this is the Australian Law Reform Commission, one would expect this to be cutting edge work in relation to law. So why is this relevant to your assessment? Well, what you're being asked to do is consider legislation and to work within that in a new space. It is one of the rare law subjects where the focus is on the future from your perspective in the assessment work, rather than applying law that has already been created. So the ALRC is a tremendous resource for you. Let's have a look at some of the examples that are there. And uh, a quick note, you may subscribe to eNews, and if you do, it will take you to uh, specific things, such as the review of the family law system or the issues around litigation funding. Um, and there's an, a little flyer for subscribing. So I'd recommend that you consider that. There's the subscription notice, which is for ALRC briefs, litigation funding, or review of the family law system. So let's have a look at one of these, the family law system. And what we have here is essentially a piece of historic information. This was published on the 13th of March, 2018. And it was at the time when the ALRC was seeking to review the family law system and calling for submissions. And you can follow this process through from this stage where the submissions were due by May last year to determine uh, where it is at the moment. And that goes back to the um, homepage, which provides you with information of where it's at at this stage. So you will see here that on the 20th of June, the update was Family Law Summary of Tell Us Your Story Responses, which follows on from the submissions. When you're considering any of these things, consider the terms of reference. That is the basis upon which the ALRC is determining the need for the reform. So, for example, in the context of family law, the ALRC is looking for information in relation to early and cost-effective resolution of family law disputes, which feeds into another unit that I take, which is alternative dispute resolution. The protection of best interests of children and their safety, the best ways to inform decision makers about the best interests of children and their views, family violence and child abuse, including protection of vulnerable witnesses and laws in relation to parenting and property division after separation. Now, of that list that I've just run through briefly, you can see that there are five discrete subheadings still within the context of review reforms of family law. And realistically, any one of those or a multitude of other specific um, areas of need for reform might be the subject of any assessment work that you do. I'm not suggesting that you limit your work to family law, far from it. It's purely an example 
But the reason I'm raising it is to say that the ALRC provides a great wealth of opportunity for you to consider. And um, it provides you with many publications as well as many different topics of uh, law reform. Let's share the screen and have a look at some of those topics. So one there is traditional rights and um, freedoms, encroachments by the Commonwealth. Um, another more general place to start is this, and I'll, I'll take you to it. Law reform general. Hopefully that's what's showing on your screen. Grace, is that's what you see? All right, so on this page, um, before I go into the specific one, We'll just have a look at the general topics that are covered by the Australian law reform. You'll see on the left, the major topics and on the right, the major areas of practice. So I would recommend that if you're struggling to find an area for discussion, or if you've already found an area for discussion, that you come and have a look at this by way of supplement to the material. So if your area of um, uh, interest is in relation to freedoms, then you'll see that there is a topic here in relation to freedoms of a whole range of things. If your um, topics uh, of interest relate to intellectual property, for example, again, you'll see a whole range of ideas and discussion points, criminal law and process, etc. So a very valuable resource and one that provides you with specific information about the law and the way in which the um, law is applied. And from a statutory interpretation perspective, it has information that relates to the common law, statutory principles, interpretation principles, and provides a very good background, if you like, as to what the legal position is at the moment, so that one can better consider how it might be reformed in the future. So we'll just get rid of that. So traditional rights and freedoms, which is where we were previously. So this is ALRC 129 and it's the summary. So on the right hand side, if you chose this area, you could look at the terms of reference, which I've mentioned you must consider at the start. Then the participants, we have touched on that in terms of who might have a say in the process. And then an executive summary, always a good idea to start with an executive summary, but you might want to fairly quickly move towards the document itself, which is downloadable by PDF or simply follow the links. So here we have the link to traditional rights and freedoms. And within that area of practice, you have a whole range of material that might provide you with some ideas and some background to the legal situation. So let's take one of these, for example, and consider the law around fair trial, which is number eight. And you'll see the um, section relating to fair trial has a wide range of um, materials. One includes the common law right to a fair trial. So it provides an excellent up-to-date and well-researched commentary in relation to the common law rights around fair trials. Again, it gives you an opportunity to think through what needs to be considered and changed, how can this be used, as well as providing you with some excellent commentary and background material. So the case there of X7 against the Australian Crime Commission is particularly relevant um, in a number of areas, for example. So when you're preparing your work, you might look at the ALRC for general ideas, for a general approach and specific law to give you a better idea of the background circumstances. One thing you will need to consider, whatever you do, uh, various common law presumptions. So this is where the material that you'll find in your textbook to be highly relevant. So if, for example, you're creating some legislation 
in your assessment, you need to do so within the context of the Acts Interpretation Acts and also the common law, in particular the common law presumptions. So if you, for example, elect to do something around religion and religious freedoms, then you might consider some of the presumptions. One is that Parliament does not intend to interfere with the equality of religion. That would generally be a presumption and um, that would be contained within that um, material um, for the ALRC. So let's just go back to the share screen. I'm using the same document, but I've just changed the page while we've been talking. And you'll see here that um, under paragraph four, previously we'd been, sorry, under chapter four, previously we'd been to chapter eight, there's some reference to freedom of speech and the common law. So if we look at the common law in relation to freedom of speech, you'll see that it's been categorized as one of the fundamental values protected by common law and there's high court authority for that. So this is something which is very important in terms of providing background and useful information, as I've mentioned earlier. So when you're undertaking your work, do consider the background situation and the um, basis upon which you're going to present your material. So why is this relevant to you? I'm inviting you to be aware of any common law presumptions that might apply in your circumstances. From a statutory interpretation drafting perspective, you'll remember that if you intend to modify or extinguish common law presumption in your assessment work, then you will need to do so using clear words. If you don't modify or extinguish the common law presumption, then as the court, considering your material, I will work on the basis that you intended that common law presumption to apply in the context of the work that you're preparing. It's very useful if you're able to identify the common law presumptions that might be relevant to your assessment work. So in other words, in your assessment piece, you should reflect your ability to identify and if necessary, modify or extinguish any common law presumptions. If you don't, I will assume the common law meaning applies unless the context suggests otherwise. Another very valuable resource for you is to consider the um, I will just I will just take you back to one more thing before I go on to the next resource, which is the Office of the Parliamentary Council. So I'm just going to go back and share this page with you. And it relates again to freedom of religion and in particular, the topic that relates to justifications for laws that interfere with freedom of religion. And you'll see again, this reference to that which is presumed. So it's generally recognized that freedom of religion is not absolute. Instead, it is subject to powers and restrictions of government essential to the preservation of the community. And there's a citation there, 104, reference also to US law. And um, uh, that's another example of where you need to be very mindful of the circumstances that have led to a certain situation and um, make sure that you're uh, able to take that into account in the work that you complete. Now I said that I'll take you to the next valuable resource and this is one that um, we will return to later in the unit and it's the Office of the Parliamentary Council. This is the federal government of course and uh, you'll see, and I say that because we've got the um, federal parliament building um, on the front cover. So this is um, a valuable resource because the OPC is responsible for drafting and publishing the laws of the Commonwealth of Australia. So what does the OPC do? Draft bills for introduction into Parliament 
and a wide range of subordinate legislation such as regulations and proclama proclamations for government agencies under delegated legislation. And then of course they assist in the publication or they do publish the up-to-date versions of Commonwealth laws. So um, I'm just going to give you something to look at now over the next few weeks while we diver diverge into other areas and we will return to this, but I want you to take into account particularly the valuable resources in relation to training and drafting. So let's look at drafting. You'll see there's a drop down at the top and there's a link to in the middle. So if we go to drafting resources, you'll see the brief description is that we, the OPC, have a wealth of information available to help agencies work with us in the legislative drafting process, including tips on providing drafting instructions and contact details if you need quick informal advice. We also have templates, drafting guides and other documents available for agencies who wish to draft legislative and other instruments in house. So you can understand immediately how important that might be as a resource for your assessment work. Because in many ways, the assessment work that I'm asking you to do mirrors on a very small scale, the sort of work which is undertaken by the OPC. So why not go to the OPC, take advantage of the materials that are there in terms of preparing your material. And if we then go to read more, you'll see that there's um, a link now to drafting manuals, which are guides for clients, drafting directions, drafting templates, always a great resource, and legislative handbooks, which is an excellent resource. And also in the context of the way in which I'm urging you to write, please consider the material in relation to plain language. And you'll see there that is absolutely the modern approach to encourage the use of plain language in legislation and to develop and use plain language techniques. I'm not going to take you much further into that website, but I absolutely expect that you will delve into those two resources that I've shown you tonight because they are both extremely important and I'm sure you'll find extremely valuable. Nicole, Grace, any questions so far? All good? All right, well, let's continue. Now, you might be asking yourself, is the assessment work that I'm asking you to do real life? And my response to that is absolutely. And perhaps the best way that I can approach this or illustrate this might be by reference to something which is in the study guide in week one. And if we share from the study guide, this material, you'll see that there is reference to subordinate um, clauses and adverbial legislation. Actually, I'll get to that soon, sorry. I'm, I'm jumping ahead of myself. So what I'll do is in, I'll invite you to go to the study guide number one and you'll see there's some commentary and um, I'll just read through that now. So it says in the commentary that you are working, sitting at work and you're faced with a request and you're working as a legislative drafter. You receive an email from a new client. So hopefully you've already read this. The client is an insurance company. And in part it says, as you might imagine, the recent floods have cost our company, this is the insurance company, the client, a great deal of money. And our profitability in the current financial year is likely to suffer. We have been examining ways in which our financial exposure could be reduced in future flood events. And one important fact which has emerged from our research is that we have paid substantial claims from motorists whose vehicles were damaged after they drove into floodwaters. 
we're soon going to begin lobbying the state government for changes to the law to make it an offence for motorists to drive into floodwaters. We request your advice as to the type of statutory instrument that would be required to give effect to this proposal. At this stage, we don't require the actual instrument to be drafted. We just want to know what the government would be required to do if they agreed with our position. So you can see the scenario there. This is application of law in a commercial context where we're looking into the future to give advice as to how the law might best be changed. Those of you that might be employers or um, people that have people that uh, look to them for, uh, for answers will always know that it's much better to be presented with the problem and the draft solution than simply the problem. So here your task based on that first week study guide is to say, well, what is the solution now for the insurance company? If they were going to present the government, go to the government, what they could do is simply say, we're paying out too much money. We don't like that we have to pay for people that are taking these actions voluntarily and causing themselves or their, their, their property damage or injury. Um, that's one thing, but it's much better to say, here's the problem and here's the solution. And the solution might be, and there's only two of you, so I won't pick on you. I won't, I won't ask you to provide responses, but feel free to unmute your microphone. Just off the top of my head, what are some of the solutions? Well, one is that you might propose introducing brand new legislation. And you could even make it easier for the government by drafting the legislation. Another approach might be to say, no, we don't think it's, it, we think it's too um, wieldy, unwieldy to have specific legislation just for this one issue. We think that we should change some of the existing statutes. That's another approach. A third approach might be to say, well, we can work within the current statutory regime but we recommend the introduction of a regulation through executive delegated powers. So you can see that there are different ways that the law might be changed to accommodate this particular request this, for this lobby group. So when you're asked to modify the law, even though your assessment recalls upon you to do a certain thing, in reality, it's much broader than that, isn't it? And when you're considering modifying the law in any way, one of the first things you need to con consider is the power of the parliament to actually make the law that you propose. So if in your assessment work you say, well, I think that parliament should introduce a law to affect this purpose, then you need to consider, just go back to square one, does Parliament have power to make that law? And of course, we'd look at the Constitution for that. There's no point proposing that the state government make a law where it has no constitutional power to do so. So number one, does the Parliament have power to make the law? Number two, consider the existing law. Now, by that I mean statutory law, including delegated legislation, on the one hand and the common law on the other. So earlier tonight we talked about common law presumptions and, and statutory interpretation. When you're considering the existing law, think about all of those things. And when you're proposing this new law, what are the basic steps? Well, number one, we have to determine the mischief. So your client in this instance has said, here's the mischief. People are causing us to pay out money because of their own stupidity, really. And we've got to do something to stop it. So that's the mischief. Um, so what is the risk then that the lawmakers are trying to manage? In that scenario, the risk is really um, in part to do with public policy and public safety, but underlying it is the commercial interests of the insurance companies 
and Parliament needs to consider whether it is important to protect the insurance industries from these payouts. So number one is, what is the mischief? Number two, what is the risk the lawmaker is trying to manage? And number three, which is the converse, what are the benefits that the lawmaker wishes to maximise? They're the three things that you need to consider after you've considered and satisfied yourself that Parliament has the constitutional power to enact. So what you're really trying to do is change the legal landscape. And as we've mentioned, changing the landscape by introducing a new statute might be the, the most obvious, but it's certainly by, not the only way to change the legal position. So one way to do it is to change the way in which the parties contract. So perhaps part of your advice to the insurance company in that scenario would be, well, we don't actually think the law needs to be changed at all. What we think you should do is change your insurance policies. And that might be fairly obvious. Why do we need to change the law when we can simply change the insurance contract? But it will only bind the parties into the future. It won't have retrospective operation. It can't. So when you're considering this piece of legislation, if it becomes legislation, you may need to consider the question of retrospectivity. Should it be that this law, which does not, which would um, exempt the insurance company for paying out in these circumstances, have retrospective effect? And of course, you need to consider the, the um, common law presumptions in that regard. So that's one way that you can change it other than statute, and that is by changing the contract between the parties. Another is to consider delegated legislation. The executive have power to make certain changes to the, um, uh, to, to the regulations. So maybe that's something that can be done. You could certainly have a new act of parliament, but that's probably unlikely. More likely would be to amend existing legislation or create some sort of delegated legislation. I hope I'm not confusing you now. Remember, of course, this is, I'm really talking about the bigger picture than your assessment. Your assessment is part of this. Oh, great, thank you, Nicole. You posted an answer on Moodle, thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, would you like to speak about it or are you not able to speak given where you are? No, noisy place, all right. Well, I'm sure I haven't seen it, I'm sorry, Nicole, um, but I'm sure it would be very good. When you're um, considering any of this material, you need to consider the uh, Legislative Standards Act 1991, and I would urge you to look at section four, subsection three, so this is the Legislative Standards Act 1991, in particular, subsections B, dealing with legislation should be consistent with principles of natural justice. Subsection D, that is legislation should not reverse the onus of proof in criminal proceedings without adequate justification. And subsection F, Legislation should provide appropriate protection against self-incrimination. So when you're drafting your material, please consider not just the statutory presumptions, but also those presumptions through the Legislative Standards Act. All good? All right. Now, as Monty Python would say, something completely different. In a few weeks, we'll return to statutory drafting, but now I want to move on to Ramsey's text, which is the complete guide to English usage for Australian students, and we're working off the sixth edition. If you don't have the sixth edition, the earlier fifth edition, which looks like that, will serve you nicely in any event. 
So what are we looking to do in topic four? We're considering English language. The subject, the object, the predicate of a sentence. We're identifying their roles. We're distinguishing between phrases, principal clauses, subordinate clauses, and identifying the various types of subordinate clauses. We're distinguishing between the 12 fundamental tenses of English language. Simple, the continuous, perfect, perfect continuous forms of present, past and future. We're distinguishing between the active and passive voice and you all know that that's a, a big thing for me. We're identifying the difference between the personal, relative, demonstrative and integrative, interrogative pronouns and identifying their importance in legal writing. And we're talking about logical construction of sentences when different conjunctions are used. So there's a lot of things that we need to consider. Um, I'll just, just digress for a moment. In your studies, particularly for exam questions, this is just to emphasize the importance of language and understanding the use of different words. You might be asked to interpret something or analyze something or evaluate or explain something. You know, many of the essay style questions start with that first word that gives you a hint as to what it is that as the examiner, we're asking you to do. So you can't properly answer the question unless you understand what is meant by the relevant critical skill. The, criti the relevant critical skill is the ability to, to interpret or to analyze or to evaluate or to explain. So just as by way of refresher, interpretation to interpret means, ah, excellent. Nicole says, I always take in with me a page which has these words and what they mean. And we talked about this in previous units. So it might be something that I helped to um, encourage you to do, but that's excellent, Nicole. I'm really pleased by that. Um, so interpret means the ability to understand and explain the significance of the information provided, analyze, examine in detail in order to show the meaning. And a big part of that is the ability to identify hidden features. Clarify means to make clear by discussing the issue involved and using them to explain. Discuss means writing in detail, giving arguments for and against. Evaluate means to work out the value, quality or importance. Infer means the ability to draw infer conclusions. And explain means to make a clear statement um, of the cause or the reason and probably giving evidence in support of that. So as Nicole has done, if you're not already doing this, please have that written down, ready to take into exams. Excellent. Okay, so they're just some of the key words that you might consider. Now you would have seen the prescribed reading. Um, if you're looking at chapter 19, and you're using the fifth edition of Ramsey, have a look at pages 47 to 48 and 51 to 54 of chapter 19. If you're looking at the sixth edition, have a look at chap uh, sorry pages 59 to 61 and 61 through to 69. In either case, you then go on to consider chapters 23, 24 and 25 in full. And you'll see the reference reading there as well from Alaka and Farrell respectively. So why is this important? Why are we talking about grammar? Grammar tells us rules about how to put words together. Grammar tells us how to convey meaning. The harsh reality 
unfortunately, is that legal writing is not intended as entertainment. So much of what you might see in a novel is not readily transferable to legal writing because we're not entertainers. We are communicators and we're, we are um, intending to communicate in a way that makes it simple to follow as best we can, even complex ideas. Therefore, the best way to do that is to write using simple words and as few of them as you can. Depart from those general principles, potentially at your peril. But of course, if you write using simple words and a few of them only, those words may be subject to different meanings. And that's one of the problems with grammar and the English language. There's so many examples of the same word spelt the same or differently um, that have different meanings completely. So let's now have a look at some of the basics. Now, I hope that we know what, so in law, we talk about sentences, clauses, phrases um, within the context of headings and chapters and parts and pages, etc. So we need to know what we mean by a phrase, a clause. We need to know what's the difference between a pronoun and a noun, etc. So a phrase doesn't con does not contain a verb. The applicant contacted the respondent on six occasions between December and January, the last part is a phrase. Clauses do contain a verb and pronouns stand in for a noun. So the use of pronouns can make it very efficient, but if you use pronouns, you risk ambiguity. So my suggestion is that when you complete your assessment work before submitting it, you should um, use a program to read it out aloud. And there are a few programs that do this. I'll take you to one of them now. Um, I think Google and Microsoft have their own versions. Is it um, Google Translate, Microsoft Translate? But um, I'll just show you this one, which is of more general nature. And I'm looking to find the share facility. Here it is. So I this is you'll find this on Google Play, but um, at Voice Aloud Reader, listen to the app read aloud or read on web pages. And the advantage of that is that um, you might find it useful in a general sense, or you might find it useful for your own work so that you can have it read to you. And you, as you're hearing it, it might be that you think, well, that doesn't, that's not entirely clear, or that's potentially a little ambiguous. I can improve on that. So ultimately, what we're looking to do is use language efficiently, but not at the risk of ambiguity. In mediation work, or even when I'm dealing with clients, I will often ask them to stop uh, for the sake of clarity. And you'll see this often that when people embark on discussion, they will often do so with an assumption uh, that you understand some of the background circumstances, because they'll talk about you know, the dog or um, that day last week. And we have to stop and say, well, no, not that day last week. Tell me which day precisely last week. So be mindful of that in your own work, that you don't fall into the trap of writing in a style that presumes that the reader has background knowledge um, because they probably don't. So um, another thing is to do with punctuation. And generally, well, not, not always, it's getting better, but some students overcapitalize and certainly use capital letters to indicate proper nouns. But um, once you've identified 
the full title of the institution to a common noun, then you don't need to, com to capitalize it beyond that. So I'll just give you a sentence and by way of example. So um, newspaper article says, the High Court of Australia sat yesterday, full stop. High is capitalized, court is capitalized, Australia is capitalized. The next sentence reads, the main matter before the court was, you don't have to capitalize the, the court the second time because what you've done is you've taken it from that proper noun to a common noun. Uh, and I see it so often. Now, I will make a distinction here, and that is if you have gone to, if you have used the drafting technique of identifying something, um, for example, High Court of Australia, open brackets, inverted commas, capital C court, close, um, close quote, close brackets, that's a drafting technique. So that's a little different because what you're doing is you're taking that full title of the institution and abbreviating it and using it as a proper noun in abbreviated form throughout the rest of your document, as opposed to the non, if you're not using that drafting technique, what you really are doing is now referring to a common noun rather than the proper noun. If that's confusing, I hope that's not too confusing, but do look that up. Also with punctuation, it is evolving. So for example, these days, we don't type MR as in Mr with a full stop. We just type MR, don't we? Have you noticed that? But in the 60s or so, I would have got a big red mark against my name if I left off the uh, full stop. So it's different now. One thing that has certainly changed in law is the fact that we now write and talk wherever we can in the active voice, not the passive voice. I suspect that you know what I mean by this. All right, so what's a sentence that I would be pleased to hear? This one. Jim told the tribunal that the victim lost consciousness. Active voice. What I wouldn't like to hear is the tribunal was told by Jim that the victim lost consciousness. You see how it's switched around? So the doer needs to be first. That which is active precedes that which is passive. And in this instance, another example would be the accused hit the victim, that's active as opposed to the victim was hit by the accused, which is passive. It's subtle, but it helps in terms of comprehension because your mind is concentrating on what is being said to you. And if the sentence starts the victim, we naturally assume that the victim did something. But in that case, if for that scenario, the victim was the um, the, the, uh, was placed at the start when it should have been the accused because the accused was the person who was the person acting in that situation. Another example, the defendant stole the computer, active. In the passive voice, the object precedes the verb and the subject follows the verb. So in the passive voice, the object, which is the computer, was stolen by the defendant, which is the um, subject. All right, so let's just go break that down a bit. And you would have read this in your material, but you need to identify, generally speaking, subject, verb, object. John hits the ball, subject, verb, object. The doer, that which is being done, and who is what is affected by the, by the action. The agent, the doer, comes first. The process, which is the doing, comes second. 
and that which is affected, done to, comes third. Now, in a very simple situation like I've described, you probably think, well, it's just semantics. There's not really very much different at all. But the active voice is effective because it's simple, it's direct, and sometimes, in fact, very often, one of the problems with the passive voice is that those who write in the passive voice omit the doer altogether. You can picture this type of sentence. The mirror was broken. The mirror was broken, okay? It's a passive sentence, but it begs more questions. Who broke the mirror? You see? So generally speaking, a simple active sentence is likely to contain more information than a passive sentence. Case law example, if you're looking for one, is Gypsy Jokers Motorcycle Club against the Commissioner of Police. 2008 HCA 4. The High Court was scathing in terms of the way in which legislation was drafted because it was written essentially in the passive voice, not the active voice. And it's not a legislative um, drafting practice that we recommend. So when you're writing your material, please attempt to write in the active voice. Now I must confess I've got another little pet dislike, and that is finishing sentences with a preposition. I know I'm probably getting very technical now, and we see sentences that end with prepositions all the time, but I think it's lazy drafting. Um, you know, worth waiting for. The word for at the end of that sentence is a preposition. Um, other examples of words that are prepositions um, are in or to or from or for. So don't, if you can, end words with those words. Avoid ending a sentence with in or to or from or for or with. You can have a prepositional phrase, for example, the DVD is in the brief. That's an example of a pre prepositional phrase. The word in is the preposition and the word brief is the object. But you can see again that what we've got is the object is at the end of the sentence. Now, sometimes a prepositional phrase will allow the reader to better understand the true position. So sometimes it is important that you give yourself a little license and make the sentence a little longer for the sake of clarity. For example, a very simple sentence. My mother's client, sorry, my client's mother cried, full stop. Becomes, my client's mother cried with tears of joy. So that prepositional phrase at the end actually enhances the meaning. So it's not always the case that the shorter the sentence, the better. Quite often it's not. But having said that, if you can simplify your language, please do so. Even on simple things like, um, I read through it. Well, why, why say I read through it when you can say I read it? Do you see what I mean? Saying through Argue, pe people might say, well, it, it means that I read it more thoroughly, I read it all. Well, I would say, just say, I read it. One thing I really like about the way in which the word program operates now is that if you use the word program, or in, same in Google um, Docs, it will have software that allows you to consider some of these things. And if you go into um, file options, say in a Word document, top left hand corner, click on file, go into, where is it? Down the bottom options. And you'll see that there is some 
word options in relation to proofing and language and ease of access uh, and privacy settings. So you can um, actually use that program to assist you in um, writing in a more favorable manner. Okay, um, another thing is try to avoid the use of abbreviated language. Take care with your possessive apostrophe. And unless you're writing in a, in a heading, please write a complete sentence. I showed you something before too early, but I'll show you this now. It's from the study guide and um, I'll just share the screen. And thank you for your patience, you're doing really well. You'll see here from the study guide, there's some commentary in relation to subordinate clause, adjectival and adverbial clauses, which are descriptive in nature. And they give us more information about one of the other components of the sentence. So adjectival clauses usually tell us about the subject or the object and adverbial clauses tell us about the verb. So you can incorporate this into your drafting. It's in the study guide, but the examples are the plaintiff, comma, having experienced this situation previously, comma, change the locks. That's really nice writing. The defendant brandished the knife in a threatening manner. The applicant filed the document, comma, which complied with the court's requirements. If you're using the word which in that context, it should follow the comma. If you choose to word, use the word that, you don't need the preceding comma. So do read that part and identify what we mean by these subordinate clauses that are descriptive in nature relative to the subject or the object on the one hand or the verb on the other. And when you're doing this, make sure that you have a clear understanding of which of the parties are doing what and that you can convey the message clearly. So for example, the um, text says this sentence. See what you think. The promisor will supply a flat screen television set and the promisee will supply a refrigerator in working order. But you'll see where the commas are. So does this mean that it's the fridge that must be in working order, but the TV need not be in working order? Or does it mean that both have to be in working order? Or does it mean that because the phrase and the promise he will supply a refrigerator was in commas, separate in some ways to the rest of the sentence, that we're really talking about the television set being in working order and not the refrigerator? Or is it both? So you can see that you need to be precise and you need to avoid sloppy drafting as we've described it there. One of the best ways to do that is to run these things by somebody else. And if they can't understand what you're saying fully, you need to go back and rework it. In other words, what we're doing is we're talking about precision. One case example that you might consider was Sykes against Cleary. And this is 1992, 176 CLR 77. Now, Phil Cleary had been elected to the House of Representatives. Another candidate, Sykes, challenged the validity of his um, candidacy. Sykes had only won a few votes. Cleary was a school teacher. He'd been on leave without pay for about two years. And he was elected while he was still officially a teacher and therefore an officer under the Teaching Services Act. And of course, the problem there is that the separation of powers comes into effect. And um, if you're a member of the executive, you couldn't be a member of the legislature. So section 44 of the constitution deals with the issue of disqualification made much more famous over the preceding years 
um, than even it was back then. And it was held by the court that Cleary was still an officer and it was contrary to section 44. And just because he was on leave without pay does not mean he was no longer an officer. And it went against the separation of powers and he couldn't perform both roles. Um, there was another issue and it was to do with the eligibility of two other candidates who were citizens of other nations, something that cropped up much more often in the future. All right, so um, let's have a look at conjunctions. I'll just share the screen. We're almost done for this evening, so thank you very much. But um, you would have noticed this commentary from the study guide. Conjunctions are basically Boolean operators for sentences. So when you you'll remember from your legal research, what we mean by Boolean operators. Primary school children are taught that conjunctions are joining words, but they actually do more than that. They do join thoughts or sentences, but they also tell us about the logical relationship between those thoughts or sentences. And you need to consider the word precisely because it will make a substantial difference to the meaning. So we have here two parts of a sentence with different conjunctions. So eight different versions. And you'll see that by changing the conjunction, we can potentially vastly change the meaning of the sentence. Or in this instance, vastly change the obligation that rests upon the applicant. So do take note of that in the context of your own drafting style and be conscious of the um, fact that these things are important, words are important. Just move on and have a look at another area. And this is to do with um, nouns and pronouns. So pronouns, of course, as we mentioned earlier, take the place of nouns. The problem is that we have to be absolutely certain what noun it's um, considering. And with that, we've I've finished a sentence there with a preposition, or at least I've inherited these, some of these notes. So, um, the contractor planted azaleas in the plaintiff's garden. He considered the soil conditions would suit azaleas best. But when we talk about he being the pronoun, at the commencement of the second sentence, are we referring to the contractor or are we referring to the plaintiff? So was it the case that the plaintiff considered the soil conditions would suit azaleas, so therefore the plaintiff asked for them to be planted, or was it that the contractor had that thought and made the recommendation and did the planting? So now consider the contractor recommended planting azaleas in the garden. He considered that soil conditions would suit azaleas best. There's no uncertainty there, is there? We've used the same, basically the same number of words, but you see that we've changed the structure of the sentence into a much more active style and it flows on. The contractor, um, in the first instance starts the, the, the first sentence and starts the second sentence. So he refers to the contractor um, as recommending. Now, what happens though, if the plaintiff was female? So there are different avenues that we need to consider. And sometimes, so that we're not falling into the trap of be, becoming gender specific, we need to be more general. And sometimes it could be a bit more repetitive and less readable. So the contractor planted azaleas in the plaintiff's garden, the contractor considered the soil conditions would best suit. So it's gender neutral, but it doesn't read as well, does it? So this is where we need to um, use your um, skills in terms of drafting material. All right.
we might leave it at that. Thank you so much for your patience, Grace and Nicole. Do you have any questions before we finish the session? All good? All right. Please continue the reading. Uh, please con continue to contribute on Moodle. Um, and thank you, Nicole, for doing so. And I'm sure, Grace, you are also. We'll wrap up for this evening and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye then. Bye. Thank you, John. Thank you, Nicole.